Praying Mantis, to me, are such a unique creature. Not because of how they're different, but because of how similar they seem to us. They sit upright and have a clearly defined head and neck and look around kind of inquisitively. They'll look right at you, they recognize you, and they'll follow your movement across a room. It's the only insect that does that. They'll raise their forelegs up and use them to explore and interact with things, and those mannerisms come off looking so much more human than insect. Although I would compare their mannerisms and personalities to more of like a small cat. We had a frame fall from the wall and it knocked one of our praying mantis habitats onto the floor and it spilled. When I ran over to check on my mantis, he was on the floor with his arms up, waving them, and when I offered him my hand, he quickly jumped on. It was like a kid who fell reaching out for its parent. It's just so incredible to me how something so alien can come across as feeling so familiar. Some people look at them and they do see an alien, green skin and big bug eyes. But when I look at my pet praying mantis, I see a delicate beauty and really, to me, they look like a bottled fairy. They're these bizarre, beautiful, vaguely human creatures living out in the forest. And I don't think I'm the only person who's ever thought that. I think a lot of things we discount as fantasy or mythology are actually just misidentified or misunderstood natural phenomena. I think when the Greeks were quarrying stone to build all of their temples, they ran into dinosaur fossils. And they accurately described what they saw as a cross between a lion and a bird. And then while modern science fought for 200 years over how the slow, lumbering, lizard-like dinosaur should look, and only just recently have they finally come around to the idea that they had feathers, the Bronze Age ancient peoples of Greece always knew. The Greeks also believed that there was once a race of giants who roamed the world. Often they depict them as cycloptic, with one big eye at the center of their head. It's not so far-fetched to believe that they were basing these assumptions off of the bone remains of European woolly mammoth. At that same time, people in Scandinavia were still thawing them out and eating them. Because when it's cold and there's not a lot of food, thousand-year-old elephant meat starts sounding pretty good. I believe the Scandinavians misidentified bears as trolls, and maybe not really misidentified. Cave bears once roamed Europe for thousands of years. Cave bear were basically like a brown bear that was closer in size to a polar bear. Um, spoken language predates written language by tens of thousands of years, and assuming cultures passed down oral traditions warning of cave bears, it's not difficult to believe that the stories outlasted the species. We actually don't know what the proto-Germanic word for bear is. It was considered bad luck to name them out loud, which is common for a lot of animals, as it might bring one down on you. The common word they used was barrow, which literally means the brown ones. So what we know is bears weren't actually called bears, which just means brown. They were called something else, but we don't know what exactly that was. The word troll has a root meaning in Old Norse that means giant being not of the human race or monster. Some speculate that it originally meant creature that walks clumsily and derives from the Proto-Germanic Truslan, which is the, also the origin for Trundle. So it's easy to think that bears were called trolls, or the Proto-Germanic root word for trolls, but it was bad luck to say that out loud, and the mythology of the troll outgrew the slang word they had adopted until they were separated completely. <laughs> Which means, if someone actually said troll out loud to you, just to mess with you, they actually were trolling. Trolling literally is as old as the word troll, which could go back thousands or tens of thousands of years. The early Europeans also believed in dwarves. I think a race of stout, crotchety, hairy humans who lived high in caves and secluded mountaintops away from mankind isn't that far-fetched when you consider that a race of humanoids fitting that exact description coexisted with native Europeans for thousands of years. Whilst in this and other ways the dwarfs do at times have dealings with mankind, yet on the whole they seem to shrink from man. They give the impression of a downtrodden, afflicted race, which is on the point of abandoning its ancient home to new and more powerful invaders. That is from Teutonic mythology, which is nearly 200 years old. I think stories of dwarves were inspired by real-world Neanderthal, who both fit the physical description and geographical location as described. While many of those examples are long gone, it's still logical to believe that many of the fantastic creatures we dream and tell stories about still exist all around us. And sometimes it feels like we know that. We have examples in film and illustration where we see fairies hidden in plain sight, using mimicry to disguise themselves as insects. As if we always knew that's what they always were. 
You can see the best examples in Pan's Labyrinth and the Spiderwick Chronicles through Tony Dieterlizzi's absolutely outstanding artwork. Thank you. Or the Bow Chuckle from Harry Potter, Thank which you. looks incredibly a lot like a ghost mantis. The insect inspiration for fairies makes sense when you assume fairies aren't that different from insects or would use mimicry to hide themselves. Praying mantis use their own forms of mimicry. Uh, you have a wide range of flower mantis species who blend in as flora. Studies show that the orchid mantis doesn't actually want to blend in with flowers. Instead, it wants to perch out on its own in the open. Because its mimicry is so good, pollinators will come to it instead of the flowers. And that their color and morphology actually outperforms real flowers when it comes to attracting pollinators. So with the revelation that mythology isn't always myth, and the fantastic is sometimes closer than you think, we can see that the praying mantis as a beautiful, voracious, delicate, alien creature is more fantastic than we sometimes think. And I think they're fairies. Uh, funnily enough, if fairies did exist, the larger praying mantis, like the Chinese species, would probably feed on them, as the larger species are known to catch and eat hummingbirds. So, praying mantis are basically like fairies, but like way more metal. Thank you guys, I love ya. Please like and subscribe, or leave a comment if you agree or disagree. It will help me keep making videos. And check out my channel for more info on keeping exotic praying mantis as a pet. Thanks.